Thank you, guys. Uh, it's really awesome to be here. In fact, I was listening to Brian saying uh, he feels like Tony Robbins. I'm like, what kind of image should I start with? And I was going to put a Jamaican bobsled team because I'm from Turkey. Actually, Turkey doesn't even have a bobsled team. And that's how I feel in terms of being in the VC business. I really don't have anything, any business to be here, but uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I was watching Star Wars with my six-year-old son last night. And he's like, stopped in the middle of the movie and said, Daddy, what do you do at work? I said, uh, I find amazing companies. I couldn't really tell him Unicorn because he's not going to get it. I find amazing companies. I find them. I invest in them. And then I try to help those companies be successful. And he said, that's it? He was expecting me to say, Daddy makes lightsabers, you know, like Daddy makes starships. So anyway, um, well, when he grows up, hopefully one day he can look at it and it's like, what, Daddy, what did you do? Um, the end product of what we do is we're a venture firm and we try to invest in and, um, you know, obviously, the previous uh, you know speakers mentioned like don't advertise. We're really proud of how far we came along, and what's really interesting about it is you know we've been in the business only for 10 years, five years with institutional capital, a lot of great exits. Uh, we're gonna have two IPOs this year, and uh, maybe to an Excel it might not matter, but for a small fund like us, it's very meaningful. I think what's really interesting about it is not just the exciting results. Uh, but how we got there. And in fact, my own start, um, my mom and my dad are entrepreneurs. Uh, I started in a country that is not known for technology. Uh, but, and I grew up um, in, a, in an environment where there was 100% inflation. Every night at dinner, my mom, dad, and I, told, I was an only child, we said, OK, what are we going to do with the money that we have? If we don't, like tomorrow, it's going to be half the value of like, work tonight. So we better not make a mistake. And I was very good with numbers, and I thought, that's great. I'm going to be a great investor, and being good with numbers is all I need. Um, when I left Google, and I was one of the first product managers at Google, I contemplated becoming a VC. Uh, one of the things that I realized is this is a very small uh, elite industry and people have very strong opinions of how things could be done. And um, after being turned down by many VCs as a potential candidate to work at their firms, um, I figured, you know what, uh, maybe this is an interesting opportunity in life. Let's try to do things differently. So the previous slide that I've shown you with you know, the great uh, results that we have, um, we've been able to grow our funds and uh, double um, the number of exits and you know, triple the exit value. I'm really, really excited about the fact that we've done it differently. And how did that work? Um, I think one of the things that came up and being mentioned, you really need to know uh, your end customer. In venture, is not being able, just being able to make good decisions, but at the end of the day, convincing the founders and finding great founders and convincing them to work with you. And I think there is this misconception, you know, venture is local. Uh, one of the things, even within Silicon Valley, our founders hail from more than 30 countries. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. I think it's really important to understand your founders, and I always wondered, even when I was at Google and I was working there, uh, we had a really great outcome, but I didn't really know how the dots connected. To paraphrase Steve Jobs, how my background and what I did was going to help me be a good VC. And it turns out I lived in four different continents. I speak five languages. And I'm really, really good at one thing, and that is going to a foreign place, getting really excited about it, and relating to people. Uh, Brian mentioned it. You know, Kate mentioned it's important to be different. Um, I think it's a really, really important quality, and understanding um, who's in front of you is a really big deal. Uh, when I was at Google, um, after being a product manager, I switched to sales. I never sold anything in my life, and I'm like, how am I going to do this? And uh, I think three months into the job, I called email in English, a Japanese portal, somehow within three months got to a VP and closed it as, I think, the second or third largest international portal deal at Google. Um, I didn't have any special skills to do that. It was sheer perseverance, and I'm like, I'm not going to take no as an answer. We just need to get this. And we have the same kind of attitude. Um, and because our founders are international, we have a unique team. And I do want to mention a point here. Um, we have about nine people today, and the first eight people we have, everybody is from a different cultural background. Everybody speaks multiple languages, and we didn't do that to have affirmative action. I really, truly believe that um, human beings always have some bias, some color that you know, their upbringing or their education brings. So we really wanted to do it uh, as part of a team that has all different backgrounds. Everybody in our team has a different background. Everybody is kind of that immigrant uh, uh, um, 
DNA, that international DNA, and everybody's self-made. And when we meet our founders, they see something in common with them. We're not some high-ranking executive that came from uh, a tough firm. Uh, even though I work at Google, I was never senior there. So I think they really relate to that underdog status, and we really bond with them. And I think our different backgrounds really help us at different perspectives. Um, our model is also interesting, so I'm going to go through a bunch of different things here. I wanted to start with a little bit of how our strategy is different, and then also look a little bit of like the end results and you know what's coming about the companies that have really worked out. So one of the things that you'll notice at Venture, a lot of LPs have very major checklists, and they really want you to be very specific and check a checkbox. And we actually wanted to do it completely differently. We did not want to check checkbox. We wanted to kind of think out of the box. So one of the things that we do is we invest in different stages. Just because our funds is small doesn't mean that we only invest in uh, seed stage kind of companies. Um, the other, I think, important thing is to really not just be where the puck is here, but where the puck is going. I'm married to a Canadian, so um, I'm learning to use hockey analogies. I'm not very good at hockey, uh, neither in bobsled. So far, the venture is going really well. Uh, but it's really important uh, to find areas that are going to matter. So when I first started investing, interestingly enough, YouTube was just uh, funded by Sequoia, and I thought, oh my god, I'm crazy uh, maniac. I missed the biggest opportunity. What am I going to do? And the, I think among the first five companies I've gotten involved, I've gotten with, you know, I've gotten involved with three companies that were in video monetization. Uh, when went public, the other one merged with another company, went public, and the third one got acquired by Yahoo for an amount closer to a billion dollars. So um, I think it's a really important lesson in you know, understanding you know, something that matters and making bets. Uh, it's not uh, super complicated. Um, I think the other thing that we do is try to kind of simplify uh, the universe and kind of try to make macro bets and invest around that. We call that thematic investing. So we call it reinvention and frontier. Reinvention is simply something that's critical but reinvented for mobile and cloud. And frontier is basically technologies that sound like science fiction, uh, but they're actually going to become mainstream faster than most people think. So it's also a lot of fun for us because we also don't see our business just simple transactions, making deals, you know, writing checks. We actually truly get excited about the companies. Actually, Brian mentioned irrationally excited about who we're working with. So we really want to relate to what they're doing. We want to understand and we want to have as much conviction, if not more, uh, than our founders to be able to work with them. Um, the other thing that we also pay a lot of attention to is not just our little pond where we fish, but also putting in the market. So just to put it in perspective for you, we actually did this interesting analysis for LPs recently, and we wanted to show them, like, even within NASDAQ, the percentage of tech companies in the overall market cap actually went down from 70% to 40%. And some areas that are not super sexy or super popular, like fintech and health, have gone from 7 to 17% and 4 to 7%. So just because technology is really exciting doesn't mean that all the obvious you know, winners of the future are going to come from that same area. Actually, some of the other areas like health, I think, are going to make a huge comeback. And the same way uh, Microsoft you know, was in a selling software business, didn't see Google coming with their special business model. Google didn't really get social and didn't see Facebook coming. I don't think the next Facebook is going to be something like Facebook. It's going to be something else. It could even be from a completely different industry, uh, something like health and maybe uh, uh, something else. But another uh, area also is that you know we, talk, we like to talk about unicorns. It's really sexy. Uh, exits. The, the nature of exits are changing, too. Uh, when I started, consumer internet is a big deal, and there are still huge consumer internet companies. But a lot of the recent exits in the last few years actually come from enterprise. So that's where actually uh, a lot of the interesting action uh, is happening. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is, is with each fund, rather than trying to be static, we've started to adapt to these realities as we've seen them in market, hopefully ahead of the market. So we started as an angel fund and, and small fund. So in the beginning, uh, pre-revenue companies represented a large percentage of our investments, about half. But later, that ratio went down to about third, even less than one third. There's been some quarters where actually we invested in zero seed companies. Uh, in the same way, what was consumer internet, which represented majority of our uh, focus, actually now turned into enterprise, uh, fintech, and, tel, uh, in, and health. And we're seeing some amazing companies getting created. So it's not just necessarily uh, limited uh, to that one area. 
Um, I think we're also looking for global winners. And one of the things that's really cool is a lot of people like to say, say venture is local. Um, I know that international has been kind of a topic that's discussed. What I think is really exciting is we've been doing it from one little office in Silicon Valley that has really not been done before. We've invested in about uh, companies that are headquartered in 11, 12 countries. We don't really invest internationally for the sake of investing internationally. We're looking for founders that have a vision of an insanely great product or service. And we like to go to wherever they are. And sometimes these people are not in Silicon Valley. We also have companies in 12 states, but they can also be outside of this country. And by the way, we don't really think of international as just a simple addition. We don't think of Canada as North America. It's a different country with a completely different demographic. Um, and just to give you an example, I mean, we have a company where engineering is in Armenia, and it's two guys that are silver, gold, uh, silver medalists in uh, World Math Olympics. We have a company in Netherlands that has 100 years of payment experience that is probably one of the world's best in payments. We have uh, a company in Finland, Rovio, it's a fantastic gaming company. Back in 2010, when everybody thought Zynga was the only name in gaming, they actually managed to come up with a brand new brand in mobile gaming and make it run in six platforms, which was unheard of at the time. So uh, again, it's not about just international, but finding people that think differently and going wherever they are. Sometimes it's here, sometimes uh, it's outside of Silicon Valley and outside of US. I think international founders are also onto something. Uh, they capture interesting arbitrage opportunities. So international investments represent about 20% of what we have. Uh, but these founders um, also uh, might have an interesting advantage we might not appreciate here. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm married to a Canadian and our first IPO was Canadian. Um, so, and the company is based in Ottawa. And if I ask anybody like five, 10 years ago, hey, like, what do you think? Like, could there be an IPO? Like, everybody will always say it's Silicon Valley. So I'm really very happy that great, nice people, you know, from an underdog location were able to create an amazing company. And I think one of the reasons they can do that is, you know, advantages that might not be obvious to us. When I was at Google, um, they were basically building in the time when everything was crashing post 2000. I think they were able to hire amazing people with no competition. Some of our companies, this is an example of two different job ads on AngelList. Uh, the one on the left, um, just to make it easier for you, the salary and options are at least a twice of the job on the right, which is in Waterloo in Canada. And not only that, but Canada also gives you a huge tax incentive that basically covers roughly half of your labor costs. So just being in Canada actually might give you a forex advantage over labor costs. And when you think about it, in technology, labor costs are, you know, the, the cost of, the employee cost is the, the most important, the biggest cost factor. That could be a huge difference in a company uh, competing with another one. Um, Picking winners is really hard. So like when my son asked me, dad, what you do? And I'm like, I pick companies. Like, I don't think he really appreciates how hard it is. And to put it in perspective for you, um, we did an analysis. So we've been doing this for nine years. We went through about 150 plus investments that we made. And we look at the ranges of valuations. So one thing I can tell you is that anywhere from convertible notes to series A, we have seen a spectrum between two and a half X to 10 X price difference. So um, the prices have moved up, and we've seen at least two to three, maybe four x uh, increase in entry valuations. What that means is that the multiple that we get is being compressed and is making our business very, very challenging. Um, and one other thing to put it in perspective is not just simply that the valuations are going up. We're living in these crazy times where everybody's talking that there is no inflation, there is zero interest. But let me tell you, I mean, I've been in Silicon Valley for 20 years. 10 years ago, if you went to Starbucks, the coffee that you buy is not costing what it costs today. So I think there is at least two, three X difference in what the real price of something that we pay today is. So I think part of that inflation is part of that. Um, but the way that we deal with that is simply focusing on things that are not valuation based. We have to play in this game. So we started paying a lot more attention to real traction, real uh, product of a company, which you know, for us is you know, most of the times is revenues. So just to give you an example, in our first board meeting with LPs in 2010, we were proudly telling them that we have six companies with over 10 million run rate. Um, in 2015, all six of those have exited, and we had nine companies that had revenue run rates of 100 million, plus another four or five that have already exited that had that revenue run rate. So the way that we're thinking is rather than valuations, which are very subjective and could be very market driven, we're basically trying to focus on companies that are 
uh, kind of driving real value, and not just revenue, by the way, it's the revenue growth potential. So one of the reasons why we invest across stage that there is this kind of adage like, hey, like everybody looks at it, I want the best company, I want the cheapest deal. You know, people basically sometimes forget about the fact that this is a long-term game. Uh, for instance, eBay has been capturing a lot of the PayPal value 10 years after the company got formed. Microsoft in you know, 1996, people thought this can't keep doubling and it probably doubled for 10 years. Google, when it first came about, people are like, oh, this is the Silicon Valley, people are crazy. Uh, Google doubled for, uh, for quite a while. Same thing is now happening to Facebook. So I think we have this um, very short-term thinking that you know, even though very few companies are able to stay on top, they actually are growing in exponential terms and doing that for a very long time, it creates for huge outcomes. So we're basically looking for, regardless of stage, companies that have somehow mastered a product that can double for at least three, five years, and the compounding effect creates wonders in terms of making them successful. Now, you know, this has also been mentioned, I think it's very important in this day and age, founders don't need your money, so we basically go wherever they are. I mean, Shopify is a good example. It took me actually not 78 calls, but I think the first five emails were not returned by the founder, and then I think the sixth or seventh email, if Debbie Landa is in the room, she made that email for us, and you know, I was able to get a call with Toby, and it was a 10-minute call, and I think he was just testing me. And then once he realized that I had conviction, he kind of tested me again and said, hey, how about getting onto a plane and come to Ottawa? By the way, I just want to let you know it's January, and it's the coldest it's ever been. Uh, and I was on a plane next day, and so he was very impressed. And so I was luckily one of the you know, first three investors in his first institutional round, and the rest is history. We had our first IPO before our, we had our first uh, fifth anniversary. But this is a chart that shows that you know, roughly 18% of our companies are outbound, meaning these founders have never heard about us. We somehow managed to get a hold of them. Those people, uh, those companies actually represent more than 50% of our fair market value. The other thing that I think is really important, um, I always have the saying that a lot of times when I'm talking to other GPs or LPs um, or even founders, like people have these very strict visions of what success is like, there are all these strict formulas. And one thing I want to tell you, everybody in this room is here, not because our ancestors were the tallest, um, were the best looking, or were the fastest runners or whatever. I think they were the most adaptable. They did whatever it needed to be so that you know, we today are in this room. I think it's the same approach that we take, which is very unlike venture capitalists, is that you really need to adapt. And like, you, it's good to come up with rules, but sometimes you need to break them. So one of the original things, like because I was part of Google, I thought, I'm always going to invest in software companies, and I'm never going to touch anything that has hardware in it. And then one day, I met the team from Meraki, and they were doing this project at Google, and they were a bunch of, uh, a bunch of founders from MIT, the smartest that I've seen. And I said, you know what, I know I have this rule, but I just have to break it. These are amazing guys. I really, really need to find a way to back them. And because of that, we've also gotten involved in Dropcam and Fitbit, and those three companies are amongst our most successful. So I think it's really important to be adapt adaptable and come up with rules, but don't be afraid to break them. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and move over to some of the bets that we made that work. And for the first time, we've never talked about this, but we've done this analysis of what kind of uh, are common characteristics of these companies. So we have about 37, 38 companies that have been valued at more than 100 million, uh, where we've kind of come in in earlier rounds. One of the interesting trends here is that they actually span across different verticals that we've invested. So I'm actually quite excited about this because um, I had this theory that when we were building our firm that we wanted to build an anti-fragile firm. So we didn't want to be like, oh, these guys had like one huge hit, maybe two huge hits. I wanted us to be able to basically span different verticals and sectors and be able to find great companies in each one of these. And I really didn't know if we were going to be able to do that. I think today, like, it's really cool to see that we actually did find multiple companies in each sector that we're involved. Um, so I, I think it's really, really great. And there are a few that shine out, but I think it's going to change over time. Enterprise definitely stands out with the most winners, but I do think that FinTech is another area to watch along with some others. Um, the other interesting thing here is that seed stage is important. It represents roughly half of our winners, but if we didn't kind of change our playbook and say we're actually going to play across stage, we basically wouldn't have all the other winners that we have. So half of our winners come from seed, but the other half are actually non-seed companies. Um, SF Bay Area, I don't think there is any way around it. This is a special place. 
I remember having breakfast with uh, uh, former Mayor Bloomberg from New York, and I know he's a huge fan of New York, and I remember sitting there with Reed Hoffman telling him that, I'm really, really sorry to tell you, but we're a little bit like Florence in Renaissance. This is a really special place, um, and I think it really is still true. I mean, there are a lot of great companies that are created here. There is no monopoly in terms of SF Bay Area, but in terms of the companies that we've seen, majority of them are from the Bay Area. However, there are some international ones, so uh, they're not to be written off yet. Um, they also, um, another interesting perspective is first-time founders. Uh, we do have experienced founders, but majority of them, interestingly enough, are first-time founders. Roughly two-thirds of companies that we back that have been successful uh, beyond the 100 million valuation and exit have been first-time founders. Um, another interesting thing that we looked at is number of founders. So we actually came up with this new concept of team completeness. So not only do we look at number of founders a company has, but how a complete uh, team a, a company has. It's a very, very important thing because it's becoming more and more difficult to hire really great people into companies because anybody who's really great just simply wants to start their own company. So uh, one thing that we found is, especially among the billion dollar plus companies, um, the companies have minimum two founders, sometimes up to three, four founders. Uh, founder aid, so I know that this is a very controversial topic. Um, I'm not even gonna try to interpret the results. I just wanted to kind of convey it to you guys. I don't think there is kind of a monopoly that you need to be 18 to start a company, or at 40 you can't start a company. Um, I started Felicis when I was 36. You know, I wasn't even 40, but I'm not planning to retire when I'm 80. Hopefully I can still do that at that age. There are amazing CEOs that are 90 years old, but I do have to say that you know, the average age of our successful companies are at about 30, uh, and some of them started companies as young as 21. So it's an interesting. Uh, observation and I don't think we have anybody who started older than 40. Hopefully that will change. Um, and it is really important to stress in, a, in an environment where companies are seemingly getting billion dollar valuation, probably not overnight, but as short as like a year or two years, it is really important to make one thing clear. No matter how good you are, building great companies still take time. So when we looked at some of our biggest winners, um, you know, we've basically seen that it took minimum five years, sometimes up to 10 years. And then just to wrap it up and kind of leave you with some interesting food for thought, um, what was kind of common among these founders? I'm gonna very quickly go through four things. I think the very best founders that we work with really understood what success is, and they've been able to reverse engineers or articulate that success vision very well. Uh, they've been uh, also, these people have a unique insight of, to what makes a product insanely awesome. Um, they kind of create their own playbooks. They don't really play or create success the way it's been done before. It's the same way we aspire to create a different breed of venture firm, not the way that it's been done, but differently. And uh, very last but not least, um, these people also uh, iterate in short bursts, but they look at data and they try to take personal bias. So they try to take objective information into their hands. But anyway, um, Thank you uh, very much for uh, listening to me. I think we might have maybe one minute to take one question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I've heard from a lot of different speakers today that um, concentrating in, in a certain area is, is, is their strategy, mm -hmm. and you were just saying that actually you were diversifying in order to be anti-fragile, which yeah. to me that's, that's a very appealing idea. You hear it works in, in so many other ways. Why wouldn't it work in VC? So why are all these people you know, concentrating when that's actually anti-fragility anti is, is a real thing. I mean, look, I'm obsessed with it because this business is so hit-driven and everybody's only talking about today's hits. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to do, so like, we've done two interesting things. Number one, a couple years ago, I told my LPs that the way we're gonna measure our success is not returns, solely returns, but NPS. So if founders don't like us, we started doing NPS score from very early years, if, you know, do we have a good brand? The second thing is, I wanted to make sure that, you know, you've heard a lot of really smart people talk about bubbles, not bubbles. Are we in a crazy environment? Are we gonna completely crash? Are we not gonna crash? Are robots gonna replace human beings and we're not gonna have jobs anymore? People are not gonna have income. So all these crazy things are happening. And I thought, look, there is one thing that's inevitable and that's change. Things are gonna change, so I wanted to be at the forefront of it, and I didn't wanna be concentrated. So 
Um, what we really wanted to aspire as a firm is to be in so many different ways. Like if something happens in the US, we have international firms. Something happens in seed stage, we have later stage firms. If something happens in fintech or health, we have consumer internet. If something happens in mobile, we have three other sectors. So no matter what happens, if something gets overheated, something gets destroyed, something gets you know, kind of out of fashion, we always have something that's going to matter because that's something we can control. We're in the creation business. We're a derivative company. We're basically only as strong as the companies that we pick and the companies we help. So it was very important to us to kind of be counter uh, contrarian on that. Luckily enough for us, it worked. Like I'm not going to comment on what works for other people, but I'm really happy that at least we can be one data point that you can actually make it work that way. Okay, I'm gonna sneak a sneak a question in, right? Like, it's, it's from from the data. It's clear you're an incredible picker. There is a conversation today about value adding as well and yeah. framing that. How would you describe the value add of Felicis Ventures? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. I think we we have a very simple theory, and that is, you know, uh, it's kind of a little bit interesting that the way I describe it is like today you walk into Macy's, there are ten different departments, and like somebody says, if you want to buy a shirt, go to floor number two. You know, if you want to buy uh, pajamas, go to floor number one. And I think sometimes, like when you talk to founders, all they want is one trusted partner that can do like a lot of different things for them. And you know, we've had situations where I talk to founders, I'm like, look, we can't really do a lot of things for you, but I'm gonna listen very carefully and what is the one thing that really matters, right? So this is not about like, there are amazing firms. I think First, First Run has done an amazing job. There are amazing firms that have built great platforms kind of scaling up what they do for their companies. We, on the other hand, kind of believe that this is kind of a one-on-one -on -one custom business, and all you need to do is listen to your founders, understand something that's meaningful to them, and just deliver a really great outcome right at the time when they need it. And also, like, we want to be one of the first phone calls if something ever happened. Like, we want to be a trusted partner. And unfortunately, it's not a one thing fits all. Like every founder has a different priority. Sometimes it's taking out early investors. Sometimes it's, you know, they're stuck in strategy. Sometimes it's hiring a good VP of sales. Sometimes it's like, how do we turbocharge our sales? Do we sell the company? Do we not sell the company? We have three different term sheets. Which firm do we pick? It's always a different question. Uh, do we grow fast? Do we grow slow? Um, do we come and start as a Delaware company or do we remain international? And these are not easy questions. And so rather than trying to have something that's going to basically one size fits all, we basically try to have enough intelligence and counterintuitively the portfolio of companies we build, because they're really good at what they do, are teaching us what the great practices are and we just then basically uh, propagate it among our companies and we act as a messenger. And that's our key value add. Well, huge round of applause to Aiden and also for the rest of the speakers.